now. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Sharon Florentine. Welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, Keys or Certs for SSH Access, and Why Should I Care? Brought to you by Teleport. We have an awesome webinar for you today, as usual, but before we get started, I need to go through a couple quick housekeeping items with you. First, please remember that this webinar is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of it, you'll be able to go back and watch it again. We will send you an email with instructions for accessing the webinar on demand, or you can always visit us at devops.com slash webinars. We'll be there for you as well. We are taking questions throughout the presentation, so you can use the Q&A tab on your console to submit questions at any time, and we will do our best to get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Finally, stick around. We are doing our drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards, so stick around to see if you are a winner. And with that, I am pleased to introduce to you today Alan Valancourt, a sales engineer with Teleport, Alan, I'm going to turn my camera and my microphone off and let you take it away. All righty. Well, thank you very much, Sharon and DevOps.com for allowing us. Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Valancourt, and I'm a sales engineer with uh, Teleport. And so today we're going to talk about uh, keys or certs for SSH access and why should I care? So as we jump into this, definitely love to get your get your questions and leverage our chat for this. And this webinar is designed to be informative and to help you learn a little bit more of what's out there and what you can do. So before I begin, I always like to throw a little bit slide brag on my family and uh, my kids. So you know, I'm I'm the guy on the right with the cheesy grin. I got two boys and my wife of almost 19 years. This year we added a new addition to our household. Uh, she's a little bit bigger than that. It's a schnoodle, one of those many breeds out there, a schnauzer and poodle mix. And then of course, you know, a little geekery for us tech geeks out there and love to hear if anyone else is a speed cube uh, collector or solver. It's something I picked up a couple years ago, just when I was on long calls or training sessions that became my fidget cube. And then it became almost an ob obsession to start collecting these. And uh, there's just something therapeutic about speed cubes and figuring that out. But anyways, that's a little bit about me. So you know that I'm a human, I'm not a bot. But anyways, let's jump into it today. So what we're used to seeing, what you're used to using. Most of you all that, you know, if you're attending today's uh, webinar are probably uh, you know, familiar with, you know, if you're doing any kind of Linux administration or you're accessing uh, remote resources, you're probably used to seeing a screen like this on your laptop, your MacBook, your PC, your, your Linux. You know, you, you go in that SSH folder and you see these uh, public keys, you see these private keys, or maybe you're used to seeing, you know, this when you're connecting to a resource, right? For instance, SSHing into an AWS instance, you you know leveraging that key, and we've been doing this for years. We've been accessing these uh, resources and with keys, leveraging them across the board. So then, this next slide here is for the admins in the group, right? Our 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 sys admins, our SREs, our DevOps. Have you ever looked at one of your servers and just do a cat on that authorized keys list? Now my little server here has only got one on it because I don't use this a whole lot, but probably in some of your environments, this authorized keys list is probably really long. Could be hundreds of entries or hopefully not thousands, but a lot. And the question is, do you know which one, which keys are valid? You know, as you know, the authorized keys gaining access, do you know what is what is valid for these? So let's look at keys versus certificates, you know, public key authentication pros, why it's been out there, why we've been using it. You know, PKA, public key authentication, I'll probably, uh, you know, shorten it to that. 
we've been using it for for years uh, as long as i've been in it and it's going on wow well over almost 20 years now you know we were using that now prior to that you're using tools like our host or even user usernames and passwords but for years as open ssh has stabilized and standardized we've been using public key authentication you're using it today probably and that's why you're on this webinar because you're like hey i'm using this but i've heard about this PKA is not going anywhere anytime soon because it's been around and it's very mature. The initial thoughts behind PKA is really security as a motivator. Why are we using public key authentication? Well, we're doing it because we don't have to worry about usernames and passwords. We don't have to use our host and, and on that line. So we're using this, the public key, just to make it a little bit easier for from that piece of the puzzle. And of course, with, uh, with uh, PKA, you can automate those processes. And you know, if you're using GitHub, using tools like Ansible, Ansible Tower, CI, CD, Jenkins, a lot of them, you know, it gives you options for potential username and password, but a lot of them would prefer or highly recommend using an, uh, a public private key. In fact, GitHub, I believe it's one of the ones where it's almost, you can use username and password, but it's really highly suggested to use a public private key in order to commit your code up into GitHub along that line. And of course, keys are really easy to create and deploy. If you've been doing any kind of uh, key work over the last uh, couple of years, really, this is the command, ssh-keygen-t for the type and then what you want. Now I've got ED25519 here. Uh, this is That's probably a whole nother webinar and topic on cryptography, so we're not gonna go into that. But personally, when, when I build a key out, I'm gonna use the ED25519 algorithm. And you know, just cause it's probably a little bit more secure and, and recommended across the board. And of course, you know, it's hard to find systems today that do not support uh, public key authentication. Pretty much any Linux system you have, uh, routers support along that line are using PKA as your kind of default way to get into a system. So we, you know, my first meme here, uh, you know, always try to make things a little bit more exciting when we're building out slides. So <laughs> why change from keys to certificates for authentication, right? You know, keys are superior. So it changed my mind. So. Hopefully through the rest of this, we're gonna you know, be doing some of that, maybe change your mind, if anything, to at least educate you a little bit more on the pros and cons. So let's jump in quickly here to the potential cons of public key authentication. What happens when your user or you moves on to a new job, a new role, et cetera? Think about that, right? They have a laptop, they've been doing work and then they get promotion or they, you know, today's very tight uh, IT market, software market, dev market, you know, they say, hey, you know, I've got another offer, I'm, I'm headed out. So what happens then? What if their device, their laptop, since so many of us are working out of laptops, we're working remotely, we're working distributed, working out of a co-working space, maybe a coffee shop, what if their device is compromised or stolen? Now, granted, we a lot of companies are implementing you know device level encryption and security on that. So if something gets stolen, everything on that drive might be encrypted. So there's some security there. But maybe your environment that's not the case, or just haven't gotten to it. So this uh, article from OpenSSH, uh, excuse me, SSH.com, uh, I got a link there, talks about these stolen and misused keys and just to summarize it and you can read it there is that in a financial case they had three million keys seven hundred and fifty thousand distinct key pairs uh from fifteen thousand servers another case four and a half million authorized keys from a hundred thousand servers just kind of let that sink in a little bit start calculating your own mind maybe your own environments how many keys do you have how many resources are you accessing Maybe you come to us or you come and say, well, we're not that many. We only have 500 servers. We're small, you know, Fry in today's world, 500 servers is not a whole lot. 
maybe you only have 30 developers or sysadmins or SRE or DevOps. So you're like, you know what, that's not that many, you know, 500 servers, 30 devs, it's only 30 keys per server. Well, you multiply that out, guess what? Now you've got 15,000 keys that you're going to have to manage across your environment. And that's with a small case. So you can see how that can scale and becomes a significant issue as, as your company grows. And everyone that I'm talking to here on the teleport side is a lot of growth happening. And so this problem is only going to get magnified. So what, what about this one, right? When someone accidentally commits a private key to their public repository. Hopefully no one here is raising their hand and saying, yep, that was me, but maybe it was you. Uh, you know, <laughs> let me give you a story. A number of years ago at a former employer, we had a new DevOps engineer that had come on board. And this person was relatively new to using Git and had not set up a Git ignore file yet just trying to you know that transition from a traditional sysadmin to that devops mindset or public repos so they were experimenting with aws and they had their aws uh, pem file their private key and they committed it to the repository and then they committed they did a git push and push that repository into a public uh repository repository there a bitbucket or github can't remember so nothing you know life goes on Within minutes, we started getting emails and notifications from AWS that servers were being spun up. So a couple of us drop all hands on deck, you know, the, the fire alarm going off, started looking at all our AWS accounts and every data center that AWS, has, AWS had at that time, which was 30 some data centers, servers were being provisioned with this compromised key. So within an hour, two hours, we had over 200 servers across 30 some data centers around the world and more were being spun up automatically. That's how fast this happened. So we were able to go in there and mitigate it. We disabled the key, nuked it, uh, stopped it from coming in and then started you know, deleting all these servers. And then of course had to work with AWS because within minutes there was a couple thousand dollars worth of extra charges put on our bill because of that. And just shows how fast that private key, when it was compromised, was able to be, be leveraged by bots and, you know, bad actors across the world. Now, granted, since then, Git, GitHub and other places, they have a little bit more better security. They actually have scanning that will go and say, hey, this file looks like it's a public key or private key. And they'll actually help prevent some of that, which is great. But four or five, six years ago, some of that didn't exist. So it was really more of a, a user piece there. So, you know, if you have a key that's across like our SSH.com article, you know, 15,000 servers, there's a potential security issue that could happen with your, within your organization. The other big thing, right? Scaling out key deployments can be really challenging. Businesses are using homegrown methods to rotate keys or commercial open source vaults to manage this. In place I used to work at where there's only eight or nine of us developers and admins, we had 80, 90 servers. So what I wrote was an Ansible playbook. So I would email the team in Slack or email said, hey, send me your public key. And then I'm going to add it to our Ansible uh, files. And then I'm going to run an Ansible playbook and then just update servers with it. So. It was really, you know, a uh, homegrown method because there was no, a lot of validation and it didn't matter. I just basically blank, you know, they sent me their public key. It went on to every server we had. And you can see, looking back, definitely not a high security, you know, thinking on that point. But it was, it was quick. It was dirty. And I talked to a lot of customers. That's what they're doing today. They're, the issues that they're facing is the scaling out piece of how do I manage public key infrastructure authentication on a large basis and can get a little bit more challenging. Of course, you know, then on top of that, keys don't expire as evident, you know, just how keys are built. So if you have a key on your laptop, IDRSA, you might not know what it is, but it's never going to expire. So wherever the private key lives, that resource, you can gain access to it. You can, you can go in AWS and, you know, that gives you some credential rotation information how long ago you've rotated that. 
And so a lot of these places you have to rotate your credentials or rotate your keys manually just because there's no, you know, keys do not expire off the top. Oh, went back there. Let's go forward. Oh, did you know as we transition here that open SSH, which is pretty much the de facto way of accessing uh, resources across uh, the internet today or, or wherever we're at, added support for SSH certificates back in version 5.4. So here's actually the release notes. It was to read it there, open, uh, add, add support for certificate authentication using minimal open SSH cert format, contain a public key, identity information, some validity, can be generated with SSH key gen and then trusted with authorized keys. So here's the big thing. Did you realize that, oops, I went backwards there. Oh, open SSH 5.4 was released March of 2010, 11 years ago. So let that sink in. So we've had the ability to use SSH certificates within our environments since 2010. So now it's September 8, you know, 2011, I mean, excuse me, 2011, 2021, and you're thinking, why am I just now hearing about this instead of using keys? So hopefully that's brought in some intrigue in your thought process and thinking, okay, you know what? I'm intrigued a little bit. It's been out for a long time. So I'm assuming 11 years, it's, it's quite mature. So let's dig into this a little bit more on that. So with all the problems that, you know, I won't say necessarily problems that we hear with PKA, so why are we just now hearing about certificate authentication? And to be honest, big companies are using this today. I mean, you're using certificates today. HTTPS, anyone, right? We can thank uh, Let's Encrypt. We can thank Google. We can thank some of the other standards that said, you know what, for browsing, we need to use SSL certificates. We need to use certificate-based uh, authentication. So that way that website says, hey, I am who I say I am. I've been vetted by a certificate authority and my information is encrypted across the board. So in essence, HTTPS is, is web standard, even though that's not an SSH certificate, but the idea is the same. There is a bit of a learning curve and we'll show that because I'm going to do a little bit of a demo here to kind of show you how this works, but it does pay off in the long run as you delve more into this. Companies are already using certificate authentication today. Uh, companies like, like, like Netflix, uh, Netflix, excuse me there as I grab some water. They have an open source tool called Bless and it's basically leveraging SSA certificates to access some of their uh, resources across the board. Lyft as well and a host of others that are using that. But really, I think the big thing is just that general lack of understanding and knowledge around certificate authentication. You know, we go, sysadmins, your DevOps, you're busy. You're trying to put out the fire. You're trying to upgrade. You're trying to update. You're working maybe with manpower shortage. And so taking that time to learn something new and gaining that knowledge around certificate authentication takes time out of that you don't necessarily have today. And, you know, can get really, you know, labor intensive on that. And then there's also been traditionally a lack of good tooling around provisioning, storing, auditing, rotating of certificates. Uh, you can Google it right now, you got Bless and some of those products out there, but traditionally there has not been a lot of really good tooling uh, around that. A year and a half, two years ago, you would ask me about this, I would have been like, what's SSH certificate? Now I'm on this other side, I, I understand it, but being in that production world, I'm like, man, that would have been amazing to have a couple of years ago or to understand that, but just not having the correct tooling around that. So, you know, and the thing is you look at companies like Netflix and others, they have that development staff in-house, right? They're large, they have huge engineering teams. So sometimes it's easy for them to, and we're grateful for that because a lot of these open source products that we all use in our day-to-day -day work and our day-to-day -day lives uh, is brought to us by large companies that have the technology and the development staff to do that. 
So a couple pros on certificates that I'd like to highlight over just why I think and why we as, as Teleport and others think that this is a, a valid option. Usability improve, improvement. So right here, right, we're all familiar with this screen, right? This warning when you SSH into something that you've never SSH before. Are you sure you want to continue? Yes, no, or fingerprint. <laughs> Guess what? Nine out of 10 times probably, or 99 out of 100, you know, we're hitting yes, because we just like, yeah, yeah, I know that's the host. And so I'm just going to accept that information. But from a usability standpoint, that's really not the friendly, friendliest uh, user interface. If you got someone new and they're like, whoa, what is this authentication, authenticity? Do I need to connect? Do I connect? Do I need to open up a ticket, ask IT? You know, it's that kind of cry wolf uh, syndrome scenario where we just, is it true or false? Nah, let's just ignore it and move on. So from a usability standpoint, certificates eliminate some of this. Then there's the operability improvement of managing certificates and host key verification, key distribution, you know, with keys, as we mentioned, using tools like Ansible or Terraform and others to scale out keys at scale can be really challenging. They don't expire. So with certificates, they do expire. It's one of the key features of it. You can set the metadata, you can set a certificate to, to live for an X amount of time. And then distrib distribution, distributing that certificate and that information is a lot a lot simpler. And then of course, a security improvement. We're gonna talk on this as well for a little bit. No more permanent keys, right? We don't issue some a permanent key and then they use it for five years and just kind of move on from there. With certificates, we're gonna eliminate some of that possibility on that. So let's look at SSH certificates in an image. And this is actually off of our blog which the link is here in the slides. And as you can download the uh, the deck here, you can read up a little bit more of this information. None of it is one I've come up, I've invented. You know, it's, it's out there written by some really smart technical engineers at our team, as well as, you know, industry standards, what's out there. So an open SSH certificate basically has a, has a couple of fields. You have a principal field, you have your signature key because it's signed and authenticated. We have a type where it's a user certificate, which would be me, Alan, as a user trying to authenticate to a system. Then you have a host certificate, which is my server saying, hey, I am an application host. Here's my certificate. Then the public key pair, because we still have that part, because what you're doing is leveraging that certificate to marry that public key and authenticate and say, yes, you are legit and you're good. A valid after and before time. So this is the probably one of the one of the bigger strengths of SSH certificates is that you can set them to expire. By default, if you roll one out, it's not going to expire. So that would be a bad security practice. So you want to have the ability to have short-lived certificates that are valid from a certain amount of time, certain amount of day, and then they expire. So anything after that time would require additional um, requisition of a new certificate. Critical options there, the key ID for log messages as things come across, there's a you know, little ID so you can identify what that is. And then another cool thing is optional SSH extensions that tie into with OpenSSH that say, hey, no port forwarding or no, no X11. There are some extensions that you can assign to SSH certificates that help lock down and, and secure some of that. And of course, our CA issued signature for, for everything to make sure that this is signed and, and sealed and valid. Because if someone tampers with a SSH certificate, it breaks that signature, invalidates it, so you know it's been tampered with and is no longer valid. So let's uh, dig it a little bit more deeper as we kind of start getting a little bit more into the weeds here on, on certificates. So we're going to do that for the next couple slides here. So what does it entail here? We've got cert certificates require a CA to own the public and private key pairs to generate that certificate. So you, you know you have your own CA, whether you build your own CA or however you do it. From a cryptography standpoint, we're not really adding anything different. We're not changing how those are um, crypt uh, encrypted still using ED25519 or RSA or something along that line. 
And as I mentioned, if a certificate is tampered with, it does break that signature and it does invalidate the, the certificate so that there's some security around that. And of course, one of my favorites, certificates can, for certificates can be set to expire. Probably one of the best features of leveraging that is being able to, to expire uh, certificates. And of course, from a security perspective, for any security uh, people on the webinar today, if you're you know, using shorter time to live on a cert, hopefully will equal that security is sleeping a little bit better at night because now you know your resources are protected by a short-lived certificate. You're not leveraging long unexpired keys or something along that line. So even if a host name is changed uh, on that, the certificate will validate. You're not gonna get those warnings. So we have host certs, which are used to identify the host that the host says who they are. Then we have a user certificate so that the user also says, hey, I am who I say I am as well. So let's break it down a little bit more here. We're gonna kind of walk into some of the actual command line stuff before we jump into the demo and kind of show you how this works in action and how you can actually play around with it today. So first of all, from a demo perspective, and this would not be something caveat in a production environment, although you can use these principles to build this into your production world, but probably not recommended from this point, unless you have a lot of time and security stuff. So we're gonna use SSH keygen. We're going to build out our host and our user certificate authority. So basically I'm using the type ED25519. I'm using a, one's gonna be a host certificate authority. One's gonna be a user certificate authority. The file name, what's gonna be called, and then a comment on it. And some of the ideas behind a host and user is that way you have two separate CAs. So if one, for instance, gets compromised, your host CA, you're, you don't have to necessarily roll or invalidate all your user certificates. You have two separate avenues of approach there. So that way you can manage it, you know, mitigate some of your attack surface. Then we're going to generate a host key and then we're going to sign it. So for this piece here, as I generate a host key, same thing, 25519, and then my output file, the dash N for passphrase, which is optional that most time, I think most of us probably don't enter passphrases when we generate a host key. <laughs> then we're going to create and sign a host certificate. So this gets a little bit longer, a little bit more verbose. So let's break this down as well. So we have the host file name of the CA private key. So as you notice the previous slide, we generated that uh, CA private key for that host. So that's what we're signing it with. The dash I is the identity of the cert. So from a logging perspective and any kind of logs that might you might have come up, we have the identity of what, you know, for this app.example.com. It's a dash H because we're doing a host certificate for this one. The dash N, which is your comma separated list of principles. So this is uh, required because you could have in this example, we got a fully qualified domain name, we've got localhost, we've got app and app node. So if something matches this list of principles from a host certificate, from a, you know, hey, is this, if I, so if I try to connect as app two to the server, it's gonna see that in its list of principles, that's not the host, that's not valid, so it's not going to let that connection go through. Time to live, so hours, weeks, years, that you can set that. In my instance, I have a plus two hours on this one. So when this certificate is built, it's valid for the time it's built up until two hours, then it'll expire. And then the name of the, the public key that I had generated as well, so we can sign it and build a cert based out of that. So we're gonna do the same thing with the user certificate. So the information is really pretty much about the same. The only thing we don't have is a dash H because we're not, it's not a host certificate. So, but we're using the uh, user key and we're gonna sign it with our user CA, the information tab as a dash, um, just calling app, the identity of that. So it can be like a username, John Doe, however, the principles as an example, Linux user usernames. So if you are using this to gate access for SSHing into a server. So you want to have a potential list of principles for that. You know, EC2 user, if you're using AWS, Ubuntu, if you're just kind of generic, you know, Ubuntu user, 
something along that line. For this valid, um, validation time, we're doing a 30 minute search. So this is a different time length than the other one. And for the certs, kind of digging, the, digging into this a little bit more, it can be even pre, so I can do something with an example of a minus four W colon plus four W. So that was valid from four weeks ago until four weeks ahead. And if you look at the documentation using like explain shell or something on SSH Keygen, look at the dash V options. There is a whole really granular level that you can go for what range and how you can make your certs valid for an X amount of time. For our instance, we're keeping it pretty short here for a demo purposes. All right, so let's continue on here. So we can now view those certificates. So if you don't believe me and you wanna say, well, did this really do anything? You're gonna see where it took that pub file and then appended a dash cert to it. And if you actually view that certificate, you're gonna see something like this in your command line terminal that looks like this. So a dash L dash F, I'm inputting the cert and it's gonna display back and you can see where this one is the host certificate identifies it right there and has a valid time to live. So this one's valid for two hours and then the principles that it's valid for which host it can kind of listen to and go from there. So that's it. So you're probably like, whoa, that was a lot of information. <laughs> what do I do? Well, let's uh, throw up my uh, my cat here. I do not have a cat. And this is probably the only way I'll have a cat is through hacking something. So let's transition here to our cert piece. And we'll go and I'll start showing you how this works. So my screen's getting a little bit busy here. I have an open source project that is linked here into the slides that you will all be able to go out and download, fork, clone, have fun with it. That kind of walks through what we're going to do is basically, we're gonna demo some certificates using Docker, Docker Compose. In essence, what we have is two containers that are going to be built. We have a Bastion uh, container and we have an application container. And so we're going to proxy jump from one to the other. Ideally in any kind of environment, hopefully you're using proxy jump bastion host to access your remote resources. Even if you are using SSH keys uh, today, that's just one of those kind of basic, I think security principles that as a enterprise, as a business, as a user, I definitely highly recommend you, you go that route. So you can see here in my bastion Docker file, that I'm using Alpine, but you can see where I'm generating my host and user certificate authorities. And then I'm generating my host key and then I'm signing it right here with a two hour window for that host certificate. And then I'm going to sign a user certificate. So I need a host and a user. So that way my user can, uh, the host can identify and say, hey, I am the Bastion host. But then I also need a user certificate so that user who authenticates has the right cert. So the user cert is gonna be a 15 minute certificate from, from this piece of the puzzle. If I look at my application host, it's pretty much the same thing. The app host needs to have a host certificate. So when it talks to the Bastion host from the SSH jump, it says, hey, I'm the app node, I'm legit. And of course, for a user, we're actually only going to do a five minute certificate because hopefully if it will time out here, I'm gonna show you what, what it looks like with a, with a five minute certificate, what happens afterwards. There is some configuration. So if you're using SSH, there is some SSH configuration that you'll need to do within your environments. So you can look at my SSH config file as reference. And we didn't really dig into this in the slides, but some blog articles links a little bit more of what SSHD uh, flags you need to set we're trusting, you know, the user cert here, the host certificate, what we're, you know, asking for. So we're kind of going on that. What you can do within that. So both of my nodes are going to have their own SSH configuration file, and that's going to let them authenticate what you can, cannot do. All right, so let's jump into this. And I'm in here, so I've got a Docker file. So we have already done this. So I'm going to use a Docker Compose. And this is really just kind of like a, a walkthrough of this. 
and it's all in the readme as well here so if you're like okay how do i do all this i walk through the readme if you do find a bug and want to submit a, a pr please do this is you know not saying this is a professional <laughs> instance of it so i'm going to go ahead and build out my two images if i look in this one I do not have any images locally right now. So let's go ahead and build out my two Alpine images. So I'm gonna build a Bastion node, and then I'm also going to build a, an application node. So I'm gonna have two images up and running here in a minute, as soon as that gets going. And we can see here, can see our images. We got our Bastion node is, is already created. It's about 12 megabytes. And then as soon as our application node gets created here as well, We'll see that as well, and there it up, there. up it's still exporting layers. So there we go. That one's a little bit bigger, just because I have a little bit more information. So so now we have our app and Bastion node that are on the system. So let's go ahead and run these. So I'm going to run it with a Docker Compose up a dash D. So if you've never used Docker uh, or Docker Compose hit Docker's uh, website, some great tutorials on helping you. But in essence, we're just running these as isolated containers and their own kind of little private network. So it's a little bit faster and easier than spinning up, you know, EC2 instances on AWS, but you could do the same with that. So we're gonna fire up my, our, our network here. So we got an app, it's creating it. We got a bastion and we have a little bit of a, a network here. So if I do a Docker PS, I can see that I actually have two servers, two containers up and running, a Bastion host and an application host that are running. The Bastion host is listening on 2222. So any connections that come in, it'll, on 2222, it'll go through and then proxy jump to our application node as well. All right, so what we need to do next is now, there is a file here called copy keys and this is a simple bash script that I wrote to help. So what we need to do next is copy that authorized um, CA, the public CA from my host in Bastion locally. So I can identify and say, hey, this is a host. So we're gonna do that. We're also going to copy my user certificates down that have been validated. So let's go ahead and run this one here. And I have a temporary folder here under S and my temp. SH files, if I look in that, you can see where I've copied some of this information down here as well. In fact, I can cap my config file, which we're gonna talk here in a little bit of what that does. So now we've copied that in. And if we look in my um, known hosts here, and I grab my certificate authority, you see that I appended it here because that was part of the copy keys is adding that to my uh, certificate authority file there. All right, so let's go ahead and connect. And first of all, let's go and take a look at this and see what happens when we connect. So let me do a Docker logs. I'm gonna do it on the application host. And my bastion. So we've got both of them are listening, waiting for connections across the board. So going back to my configuration file, oh, wrong one here. We can see that I'm going to connect to the Bastion host, the application node, but I'm using a proxy jump. So I'm using my identity file as my app user key and logging it as app user. And so what it's going to do, it's going to leverage that uh, short-lived certificate that I generated um, for this. So we can actually go look at this short-lived certificate right here and you can, if I be in the right um, folder there, You can see that this is valid for about five minutes. So I've got about one minute left before it expires. So let's go ahead and SSH into this. So I'm gonna SSH into this uh, application node and I keep doing it from the wrong folder. Try that again and boom. So what just happened? I'm on the application node if I type in dad joke, guess what? I've got a you know an app that ran and there we go. There's our daily dad joke. 
So what happened all this time, you saw some logs come across my two screens here. So we see that the Bastion accepted a certificate because I authenticated as that user. It says, hey, we have a certificate, it's valid. We have the app user certificate that also was able to log in as well, which is which is cool because it's using that instead of that you know public private key. Now, if I exit out and my certificate, I believe should be expired because it was a five minute certificate. If I try to authenticate in, actually this one is still still valid, hasn't fully expired yet. So if I look at my verbose logging from the SSH side here, we can see where it talks to the Bastion host. It actually displays all the principles that are listed with it, as well as the app host, because it's doing a proxy jump. And it's saying, hey, it's app example, local host, app or app node. It sees that it matches that. It matches my host certificate. And then it's going to say, you know what? Alan's valid. We're going to let them in. Now I'm on the server and I can do work that I need to do. And so what happens after a certificate expires is that it gets denied. So as you remember, I created a five minute certificate. So now I just try to connect and all of a sudden I'm getting a permission denied. So if I look at my certificate, you can see that it accepts it. It sees that it all should be good. Everything looks like it's, it's legitimate. But here's the key piece right here. My certificate is invalid because it expired. So remember, I created my Bastion certificate it was 15 minutes, so it's still valid. But my user certificate as a user was only five minutes. So now I have lost access to my server. And so that's the power, the value of leveraging you know, SSA certificates is ability to have that short lived and you know, expire certificates when they come across the board. And so now for me to gain access, I need to generate, I need to reissue a new certificate in order for me to gain access into this system here. Now, granted, since this was uh, Docker images, I would have to rebuild the image and all that line. When you play with this uh, repository, if you go into the app Docker file, your time to live is set right there as five minutes. So if you don't want it to expire within five minutes as you're trying to you know, play around with stuff, set it for an hour, set it for a week, you know, experiment. Again, this is kind of containerized system here where uh, you can leverage some of this. So there you go. I know that was a lot and probably brought up some more questions on that. Like, OK, that was cool. I'm using certificates versus, you know, um, SH keys. And again, how do you get started? Let me throw this out here. So this is my uh, GitHub where I have this demo. There is two branches for it. So there is a, a regular branch and then there's a branch called 30 minute cert demo. And that's the one I use today. So feel free to fork and go to this branch and, and leverage that to play around and start learning, experimenting how you can start using something like SSA cert certificates as well. Company I work for, we have an access plane project that takes the complexity of all of this manual stuff and makes it really user friendly. So there's our open source project. So check that out and and see if maybe, hey, maybe we can instead of rolling my own, we can use this. And of course, there's way smarter people out there in my company than I am. So we've got to read a little bit more about it. There's two great blog articles here that detail a lot of my content where I built it from, where where it comes from, who that person is, uh, you know, how you can leverage certificates on that board. You can find me here on on LinkedIn as well. So love to get love to connect there. I'm also on Twitter. We have a open source community Slack as well that uh, is available for people to kind of join and 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 check it out. So love to have community involvement on that as well. And one last thing here before we jump into some Q&A, because we uh, definitely, I think we have a couple questions here, is we're hiring as a company uh, with this tight market. Love to uh, you know gain some interest there. Come check us out as well. So anyways, want to flip it over here to last few minutes here, answer any questions around what you saw today. Awesome. 
Um, let me ask you a favor, Alan. Um, a couple of folks in the chat were saying it was a little bit hard to see when you were doing the demo. So would you be able to flip back to um, the slide where you had the links to the repo? Oh, yes. Um, awesome. That way, um, I apologies um, to those folks who weren't able to see. Um, so hopefully, um, if you take these links and we will, um, well, there they are. Sorry, it was taking a second to load for me. Um, you'll be able to go in and um, see the the repo that Alan used in the demo from there. Hopefully that will um, will be helpful. Um, all right, Q&A. So let's see. Oh, and I'm getting a little echo here. I apologize for that. Um, so question here, is certificate better than key? Which is more secure? Sometimes with a VPN, SSH does not work, but then is it secure without a VPN? So that, that's a great question. And, you know, VPNs have their time and place and VPN is... You can use them in both, but there's complexities. I, I guess it sounds like you've encountered some of that where you're trying to VPN and then SSH doesn't see that. SSH is not a SSH certificates is not a replacement for an enterprise tool that you might need like a VPN. If your company needs it and that's a discussion kind of out of today, you still might have to have that. But what the SSH key piece does and our product teleport, which is the open source, it helps eliminate, reduce some of that complexity of adding another layer of security on top of that. Because if you have a good SSH certificate authority and system set up, in essence, your connection to that is encrypted, it's secure, and technically you do not necessarily need a VPN. But again, I think it's a little bit more deeper discussions that would have to have with technical teams and security teams across the board. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Um, we have a request for you to flip to the slide with the contact information. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Hope that is helpful as well. And folks, just uh, you can grab uh, the slide deck here under the handouts tab. The whole deck is there. So you can go ahead and download that too. So you've got it. Um, all right, let's move on here. Does SSH work for all situations? Ooh, great question. That sounds like a loaded question there. <laughs> SSH, you know, most devices, and this is where, like if you have routers and switches that leverage SSH, and you can do that. So if you have the ability that router switch to support SSH certificates, then you could leverage SSH certificates probably to gain access to those systems there. I'm not a router guy. I'm networking is like 15 years ago in my past, so I can't speak from experience, but I know there are newer networking tools like um, EOS and Arista that are software defined that are based on Linux kernels that use SSH. So there's a really probably solid possibility that you could use keys to do that. For our environment, what I use, you know, I've pretty much gone away from keys completely and I use basically SSH certificates. And sometimes though, you might still need what we call a break glass scenario. So maybe you still have one admin key that in essence, if your certificate authority goes down or certificate expires, you still have a way to access those resources, kind of like the master key, the master skeleton key in you know, lock picking terminologies where you would have a, a way to gain access to resources. And that still might require you have maybe one key, which is still a lot better than having 500 keys or more sitting out there. Yeah. All right, folks, if you've got any more questions, go ahead and send them in. We'll give you another couple minutes here. And uh, if we don't get to yours, rest assured, we're going to round all these up, send them over to Alan. He'll be able to follow up with you offline. And again, please go ahead and download the slides. Um, you can get to the demo uh, repo that Alan was using and all of his uh, contact information there as well. 
All right. Um, well, it looks like we have answered all the questions I have here in the queue. Uh, folks, uh, you can still send them in while I go ahead and draw the winners for our Amazon gift cards. So our first winner today is Keith T. Our next winner is JT. Our third winner today is Charlene O. And our last winner is Francisco M. All right, so we had a question come in while I was reading the gift card winner. So we're just going to flip back over here and get that answered. Um, okay. Has there been a situation where cert-based SSH wasn't practical? Hmm. I'm trying to think. I can't, off the top, I cannot think of anything where a cert-based SSH when practical because it's using the same cryptography you're just adding i think some better layers from an audit trail from an expiration trail so i'm, I'm trying to think where in not some situations we do here some companies are are wondering how do i use short-lived certificates with an automated process like jenkins and ci cd and there are ways around that, maybe having a longer live certificate. Maybe it's a six month cert or a one year cert versus a eight hour certificate. So that might be in a situation where some practicality and having to go through your, your pipeline uh, might cause some issues. But other than that, I cannot think of any situation where cert based SSH wasn't less practical than, than keys. Okay. Cool. Great question though. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So folks, uh, just a reminder that the session has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, you want to go back and look at the demo or anything, again, you'll be able to do so. We will send you an email with instructions for accessing the session on demand, or you can always visit us at devops.com slash webinars, and it will be there for you as well. For our gift card winners today, we will send you a separate email with instructions for claiming your gift card. So everyone keep an eye on your inboxes. And if you don't see those emails there, make sure to check your spam folders. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you so much, Alan, for this awesome presentation and demo. We really appreciate everyone's time and energy. We hope we will see you again soon at another DevOps.com webinar. I am Sharon Florentine signing off.